you know, we do have nutritional strategies prepartum, namely uh, negative DCAD rations. We know from a you know, significant body of research that negative DCAD rations fed in that late dry period do promote um, improved calcium homeostasis postpartum. A lot of the studies that we did during my PhD and ca- that came out of the McCart lab, most of those uh, herds that we utilized were feeding negative DCAD rations. So a lot of the dyscalcemia work so far has been done on herds fed negative DCAD rations. So to that end, there is another dietary strategy we can also implement that is gaining popularity, and those are calcium binders. So hello, everyone. This is Luis Ferrero with the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt podcast. And today we have our second episode discussing subclinical hypocalcemia in dairy cows with Dr. Clara Seely. Clara, thanks again for joining us. Sure, yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm sure we still have a lot of great information uh, that people at home is looking for. So let's get into this discussion. So that leads me to a different question then. So for, for the dairy consultants out there, uh, willing to uh, evaluate the herds that they work with and identify if the herd has issues with uh, subclinical hypocalcemia or not, mm-hmm. how do they do that? I hope in a prayer. No, <laughs> um, if they have the capability of taking blood samples, that's really the best way and the only true way to diagnose subclinical hypocalcemia as it stands because we don't have a calcide meter um, for blood calcium like we do for BHP. However, with the knowledge that I just presented to you on our you know, new term of dyscalcemia, so low blood calcium at four days in milk, if you're going to take the time to go out and look at blood calcium on herds, we're suggesting that you do that at you know, three or four days in milk as opposed to right after calving. Looking at blood calcium at four days in milk is going to give you a better idea of what percent of your herd is experiencing dyscalcemia and if you have an issue there. Um, so that would give you a better idea. And Unfortunately, like I said, as it stands, it's the only way we can really understand if we're having a dyscalcemia problem. No, absolutely. So that suggests that the best approach is prevention, <laughs> yeah. right? So said that, what are the tools available uh, or strategies available that can help us uh, to prevent this issue? Yeah, great question. Um, and I will preface by saying, you know, I am, I'm not a nutritionist. I like to give these disclaimers in all the talks. However, you know, we do have nutritional strategies prepartum, namely uh, negative DCAD rations. We know from a, you know, significant body of research that negative DCAD rations fed in that late dry period do promote um, improved calcium homeostasis postpartum. A lot of the studies that we did during my PhD and ca- that came out of the McCart lab Most of those uh, herds that we utilized were feeding negative DCAD rations. So a lot of the dyscalcemia work so far has been done on herds fed negative DCAD rations. So to that end, there is another dietary strategy we can also implement that is gaining popularity. And those are calcium binders, uh, primarily zeolite A. I know a lot of herds up here in New England, as well as I believe Wisconsin is a pretty popular user of zeolite A. Um, These are calcium binders. So they uh, bind calcium within the rumen and modulate low blood calcium for that cow. So preparing her for that calcium demand in early lactation, essentially priming her homeostatic mechanisms by binding that calcium within her rumen. Now, there's not as much work done on these zeolite A's, uh, to see how that impacts blood calcium dynamics. And it's certainly something uh, that warrants further research as these cows in research projects that we have seen come out do have improved blood calcium in early lactation. However, that does lead us to wonder, you know, are we minimizing that cow's ability to have that transient reduction in blood calcium that we think she needs to, you know, go on to make a ton of milk? So big question marks around that. But, you know, our primary dietary strategies are negative DCAD and the zeolite A. Postpartum, we do have other opportunities for, I don't really want to say prevention, but it's almost pre-treatment of subclinical hypocalcemia, right? So we can give uh, IV or sub-Q calcium, which 
We do not recommend giving to cows that do not have clinical milk fever. You know, there's always the thought that more is better, right? She's not down yet, but maybe she will. So let's just give her some calcium. Not a great idea. Unless she's down, do not give her a bottle of calcium. However, we do have oral calcium boluses um, that are generally prescribed to be given at zero and 24 hours post calving. And that provides a sustained increase in blood calcium through a slow um, absorption of calcium from that bolus that we give the cow. And like our previous subclinical hypocalcemia research, it's a mixed bag in terms of production outcomes when we give calcium boluses. Sometimes cows make more milk, sometimes there's no difference, same thing with repro and other health events. So that led us to believe and wonder, you know, are we giving these boluses at the correct time? now knowing what we know about calcium dynamics. So if low calcium at four days in milk is a bad thing, why are we giving the bolus at zero and 24 hours in milk when it's going to be gone by four days in milk? So we did a project uh, a few years back uh, where we delayed bolus administration to 24 and 72 hours post calving. Um, and we explored what happened in terms of milk production and health events in those cows that got the delayed bolus um, at two and three days in milk to see if that improved health and production outcomes. And interestingly, we did see in third parity cows only a significant improvement in milk production given that delayed bolus treatment compared to conventional bolus strategies and cows that received no oral calcium. So there was a subgroup of cows that benefited from that. You know, we're still not sure why that occurred, but there is opportunity and warrants further research to see if, you know, there's specific groups of cows that would benefit from that delayed bolus. You know, how do we identify those cows and manipulating the timing of bolus administration is definitely something that's, you know, going to come down the pipeline in the future and could save pro uh, producers money and also lead to improved production for their cows. The next giant leap in dairy profitability is here. Introducing AffiCollar feed efficiency service from AffiMilk, the first sensor to accurately measure individual cow dry matter intake. Combined individual feed consumption with milk production data to get profitability insights never before available. Hear from producers who are using it to make a big impact on profitability and sustainability at AffiMilk.com. That's A-F-I-M-I-L-K.com. Now, certainly, and I think all those strategies, uh, people are using the field and mm -hmm. have their own experiences with that. So, so probably there is a lot there that obviously we still have to learn, but I do think we are on the right path. And out of curiosity, you mentioned that uh, these effects for the third parity cows compared to the other parities. Did you compare with... Uh, or, uh, first and second lactation cows or also older cows? Yeah, that's a great question. So we did not enroll any primiparous cows. So it was just second and greater lactation and we dichotomized or we broke our cows down into, you know, second parity, third parity and fourth and greater lactation animals. Um, and in our second and our fourth and greater lactation cows, there was no difference in terms of bolus strategy but just in our third lactation. And the really interesting part is we did this on th uh, four farms with vastly different management strategies. Um, and it was the same throughout all farms. Like we saw the same difference on each farm with those third parity cows. So we're not sure why, maybe it's just, you know, calcium demands of that specific age group of animals. Um, but it was repeated across four different farms in different regions too. So interesting stuff there. <laughs> Well, Clara, thank you so much for all this information. I'm sure people have a lot to think about it after all this discussion. Uh, but uh, I, I do think that there were a lot of points that uh, people truly have to consider because at the end of the day, decreases profitability. It is a huge issue for cows, but there are strategies out there that can help people to figure out if the issues exist and how to prevent that. Uh, so thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Ariu at home, uh, for listening to the podcast, and I hope to see you soon.